Uh, welcome, and uh, it seems my one cat has joined us just in time. Uh, so welcome to this roundtable on Indigenous sovereignty and Black liberation. We appreciate you taking the time to support our invited guests and to reflect on how we can pursue a more just and liberatory future. Um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, so please keep both your mic and your video off for the entire um, session. I also suggest that in, in the little corner of, of, your, of your video, which would now be black, you can select uh, from the three dots and hit hide non-video participants. And that will allow you to see um, our guest speakers really nicely on your screen. Um, live captioning is available through Otter. Um, it's an auto captioning tool. So if you click that little live button and then you can open up another web page that will have the live captioning. Um, chat will be closed during this event, um, except for right now. Um, I should be opening up and I would love to hear where all of you are joining us from if you want to put that in the chat. Welcome. We have quite a few from Pittsburgh with people in parts of Ontario, Quebec, Philadelphia. Wow. Treaty 7 territory, Treaty 4. All the way from Florida, Treaty 6. Welcome, everybody. Um, so we'll take questions not through the chat function, but through uh, a Google form. And um, a co-host, uh, Brittany, will be submitting that link in the chat now. And so I suggest that you copy and paste that link because we will close the chat. Feel free as you're hearing the, the speakers uh, share to submit questions um, and those will be taken up at the end. We'll start with a discussion between our three guest speakers and our moderator. Um, and then once that time is over, we uh, the moderator will, um, will look to the, uh, to the questions. It seemed, yeah, okay, Rhonda, I hear you uh, saying something about permissions. I'm going to double, I'm going to double check that. And then once the form is correct, I will make sure to circulate that again. So apologies for that. Um, today's roundtable has me thinking about Pittsburgh. It's past, present, and future. A city thriving on white supremacy, but also a site of disruption and revolution. One example, the large sculpture of Christopher Columbus near Phipps Conservatory now sits wrapped under tarp after the Pittsburgh Art Commission voted to remove it. Months before the uncovered statue had been spray painted with anti-Columbus and pro-Black Lives Matter messages. Pittsburgh's story is only one of many protests across the country. And it's only one instance in a rich history of indigenous and black solidarity. And today we will hear more about the work and dreams of our three guest speakers and moderator. I'm grateful to them for the experiences and wisdom that I will share with us today. Sunshine Adam is a black, queer, Afro, Latinx immigrant from Sao Paulo, Brazil. They are currently an MA student at the Center for Gender, Sexualities and Women's Studies Research at the University of Florida. As a proud member of the Wellness, Equity, Love, Liberation, and Sexuality, or WELLS, Healing and Research Collective, their research centers on the wellness of Black and Afro-diasporic communities. They believe community and collectivism are at the center of healing and liberation for all. Zainab Amadahi is the author of screenplays, nonfiction, and futurist fiction. 
She currently sits on the advisory council of Muskrat Magazine, where many of her writings appear. In her role at Children's Peace Theater, Zainab works with the council, staff team, and BIPOC youth to explore healing and decolonization through artistic processes. Based in a peri-apocalyptic Toronto, Zainab is the mother of two grown sons and a cat who allows her to sit on one section of the couch. I hear you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Erica Violet Lee is, Nehio, is a Nehio writer, poet, and Indigenous community organizer from inner city Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. She holds a BA in political theory from the University of Saskatchewan and an MED in social justice education from the University of Toronto. Her work focuses on indigenous feminist and queer liberation, as well as the intersections between black and indigenous freedoms. Elena E. Roberts is an assistant professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research focuses on the intersection of African American and Native American history from the 19th century to the modern day with particular attention to identity, settler colonialism, and anti-Blackness. Her first book, I've Been Here All the While, Black Freedom on Native Land, published with the University of Pennsylvania Press, will be out this April. So I welcome you all, and I now pass the baton over to Elena. Thank you, Alexa. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for talking with us today, Sunshine, Zainab, and Erica. I hope you'll all feel comfortable talking to me and to each other about the questions that I'm going to pose to you. Uh, we recently had Dr. Tiffany King speak at the University of Pittsburgh's World History Center. So this is a wonderful follow-up and I think it will really highlight the multiplicity of ways that research and activism that brings together Black and Native studies and people is important. So as kind of like more of a, a little introduction about myself, um, for the past 10 years, I have conducted research on the intersection of Black and Native history and also been involved in initiatives on several campuses to bring to light these intersections as well as the divisions between these two communities. And this is close to my heart because of my identity. So I'm Black and I'm also Chickasaw and Choctaw, a mixture that comes from my ancestors' enslavement by Chickasaw and Choctaw Indians. And so I wanted to start today by asking all of our panelists to tell us how you came to this work you do now and how your personal identities and histories play a role in that work if they do. Thanks, Selena. Um, so for me, um, my identity is also mixed um, in many, many ways. <laughs> So I am African-American, uh, Cherokee, Seminole, uh, Pacific Islander, and many other <laughs> trace elements, including European in there. Um, and my, uh, the indigenous, or sorry, the Cherokee and African-American um, ancestors in my family were enslaved on the Reynolds tobacco plantation. So, um, my heritage that I know about dates that far back as well. Um, and so this has been kind of a lifetime issue for me, first exploring it in terms of identity um, and then uh, looking at it uh, as relationships between communities as a form of resistance as a form of liberation, as a form of decolonization and so on. So that's been, uh, it's been a long journey. <laughs> I'm old, so I should have, <laughs> I should have a lot more to say, but uh, generally speaking, that's been kind of where I started is kind of like struggling with identity issues. And where I am now is looking at building relationships across communities for the purposes of creating you know, a more equitable, uh, kinder, more beautiful fu future uh, and better relationships, not just between our communities, also with the land and, and the other peoples on it at this point uh, in the Americas. So that's where I'm coming from on this topic. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I'm Sunshine again. And 
I, I think I'm coming from a similar place in some forms, but in other ways, I think almost like on the opposite end, I am Black, I am Afro-Latine. Um, I grew up in Brazil and my Black side um, is from Haiti, but I also, I also have like European, I guess, heritage on my mother's side, um, who is Brazilian, but um, her ancestors were from Portugal. And I think as I entered a place of trying to understand myself and my role in the movement for Black liberation, I started grasping also like grappling with this, like not knowing my place in terms of like, what do I do if I have like, I mean, like, you know, like this family of colonizers who still hold so many views and like that I so deeply oppose and are so like deeply against my existence and like my liberation and what is my role in like just like managing like these both sides of myself um, and then putting myself in the context of Brazil which is where I grew up and watching all of the um, issues happening with like indigenous land and um, indigenous massacre and everything that's happening in Brazil I feel like I was at a place where I was like, I need to stop and understand all of these pieces so that I can move forward and work for liberation because I, I'm still trying to figure all of these pieces out. Um, and even when I speak of my mother, um, it wasn't until like three months ago or something that I learned that she's actually half um, native Brazilian and like that there's all these other pieces coming in. And I feel like in my work um, for Black liberation, which is what I do the most um, here currently in the United States, I I find I found myself like encountering a lot of narratives of like, well, we're all mixed anyways, or like especially when I do work with Afro Latino communities or like Latin American communities, that, and I'm trying to speak of Black liberation. I think often people say in Latin America, we're all native, we're all, um, we're all mixed, There's, it's all a bland, so we don't need to think about race, we don't need to think about these things. And I've encountered a lot of that recently, and now I think I'm sitting down and being like, okay, like, how do all of these pieces work together so that I can talk back to folks who are trying to move away from liberation work? Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but. It uh Thank you for those answers. Those are really important ways to situate um, this, the beginning of this panel. So for me, where I came to it, I think, I guess, was from identity to, for starters, I grew up Nehio or Plains Cree in a predominantly urban Plains Cree and Métis uh, setting. And then very quickly learned once I got into urban studies and thinking more critically, about my surroundings as an urban indigenous person, um, that it, urban studies is a black field, that it's something that was created um, by black scholars, by black community members. Um, and so it, for me, it was impossible to study my lived condition without acknowledging the black scholars and community members who came before me. Um, I'm also part Maori and Anishinaabe, uh, which I'm slowly learning more about and sort of the relationalities that that brings me into, um, which is such a complex history on this land. Um, and ultimately, I think what brought me to recognizing that Indigenous freedom, uh, so Native, I use the term native in 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 term of in terms of Saskatchewan, at least the prairies, thinking of native freedom and black liberation as tied is like reading the literature and decolonization and recognizing that none of that would exist without the like the writings and the histories of 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 black folks um, resisting and writing. So um, finding Franz Fanon for the first time and realizing this is what I need to know in order to actually 
understand decolonization and what it means in, even in a na non-Black Native context, um, that that can't be erased. So that's where I'm coming from. So you all mentioned identity. I mean, and I think that's so relatable because um, most mixed people kind of struggle with identity. Um, but in the Native community and in the mixed Native community, I feel like that is, it's becoming more talked about, but it's really only recently. Uh, I feel like that's kind of like why Tommy Orange's book like did so well, uh, because it kind of brought that identity struggle to the masses. Um, a lot of people who didn't even like realize, you know, there were Native people here today still. Um, but the idea of your identity really shaping not just the way you think about yourself, but the way you think about uh, various scholarship, the way you think about your relation to other people. Um, and so Erica, you mentioned uh, how you kind of came to it in like an academic way and like the way you began to think about scholarship. So Zainab and Sunshine, is there like a body of scholarship like at all that like helped you think through this or like even like authors, literature? Um, how would you say your work has transformed over time through the things that you've read and come into contact with? Well, for me, um, at my age, probably the first, um, the first time I started thinking really strategically and politically was in the civil rights movement. Um, and so I was, um, you know, probably, I was a teenager uh, and a child during the civil rights movement. My parents were involved. Um, so, uh, so that's where I started thinking about a lot of these issues. Um, I don't remember doing a lot of reading particularly, <laughs> um, but that came later when I, um, as a mature student, went to university uh, and was very interested in, in issues, you know, anti-oppression and anti-racism and these kinds of things. Um, so that was kind of my, uh, that civil rights movement really shaped my, and the Black Power movement as well, and the American Indian movement all shaped um, the way that I started thinking about identity and uh, started shaping my sense of responsibility in terms of um, activism and how to change things, uh, you know, the anti-oppression work and so forth and so on. So, um, and then in terms of my journey, what happened was uh, I was very much known in my younger years, uh, maybe up until probably about the age of 35 or so, uh, locally, particularly as, um, as an activist and working with the uh, pan-Indigenous movement here in Toronto. Uh, I moved to Toronto um, when I was probably about, what was I, 19, and went to school here. Uh, and um, was involved in the community work here. And so that's how I kind of became involved in the kind of what I, what I would say the pan-Indigenous uh, community of Toronto. And so there were various, you know, um, activities and movements and uh, some of these um, intersected with other movements and so on. So, uh, and then I, because of a, an illness that I experienced, uh, got really seriously involved in you know, teachings and spiritual teachings and cultural teachings um, in healing, uh, healing um, uh, from a, an Indigenous, um, again, pan-Indigenous perspective because of what was available to me in Toronto in terms of the elders that were available. I served as an elders helper with one of the elders here in Toronto, Pauline Shirt, who's well known as someone um, who is a resource on many, many issues, but also as a healer. Uh, uh, and someone from the Medewin Lodge here in Toronto. So anyway, so um, that has brought me around to this question of looking at relationships, uh, relationships to Okay, I think we lost to each other as human beings, but also uh, to land. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I freeze up there? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I don't know where I left off, but 
um, yeah, so that brought me to, so the, the spiritual piece and the teachings and the healing work that I did brought me to a place of looking at things in terms of relationships and looking at relationships across our communities, relationships across, um, you know, with, with land, with the other beings on the land, relationships to the cosmos and the idea that, you know, it's all spirit, everything's spirit, there's nothing but spirit. And um, so what does that mean in terms of um, in terms of healing and in terms of collective healing and in terms of creating a better future. Um, and so now I'm, I'm really looking at the relationships between personal healing, personal transformation, collective healing, decolonization, social change, and all these questions, because I think they're very, very related. So sorry for that, <laughs> for freezing up and blathering on, but you asked, and so there you go. Thank you. Um, I think on my end, I realized I, as I was thinking about this question, I realized that I think my background in um, women and gender studies, African American studies, and like Black healing um, works come out more. And that's a calling for myself on not knowing enough indigenous work to cite or like to in indigenous scholars to bring into this space. Um, because as I was thinking, I was like, well, I think I tried to inform myself. I, I think one of the most important things for me is always making sure that, especially since I am currently in an academic setting, I feel like it is really important to bring in knowledge from all types of um, knowledge creations and not just like academic, um, you know, like acad academic scholarship. But so I always try to bring it back to valuing embodied knowledge communities and stuff like that. But when I'm trying to think of authors um, activists and scholars, I feel like I'm thinking, you know, just the basics like Hooks, Lord, um, Spillers. I also lately, although this is not like fully related to, I mean, it is related. It is. So um, lately I read um, Riley Snorton, C. Riley Snorton, and um, they speak on Blackness and transness and the creations of like gender, sexuality, race. And I found that weirdly like ground, like it just made so much make sense even with my knowledge of um, my limited knowledge, especially at the time of like indigenous sovereignty work and, um, and everything. I feel like it was like a very snorting opened doors for me to read more works about like what true like like decolonization could look like or like pre-colonization. Um, so that was really good for me, but now I am I am missing actual like indigenous scholar activists to name. So I, but I'm excited to have people here that I know are like experts on it. <laughs> Well, Zaina, first of all, please don't feel like you're blathering on. I love everything you're saying. And I think it's actually really great to have kind of this this parallel, like this difference in seeing like a long journey and like how you've changed and evolved over time and the way you think about yourself and your activism and, and you know, like us younger folks and like what we're doing and how we're going to change over time. So I really appreciate um, you and also you, Sunshine, and you, Erica. So since we're kind of in a more academic conversation right now. I promise we won't stick to that. Um, but I did kind of want to follow up on asking if you're all familiar with Dr. Tiffany King's work and how she talks about Black and Native studies. And especially more recently, she is talking about how a lot of theories um, such as settler colonial studies and fields are really kind of centered on, especially this relationship to whiteness. And so how we look past that to look at things like 
you know, what does it look like just talking about Black and Native people together and those relationships and that history? So what are your thoughts on that, all of you? I can start on this one. Um, I think that for me, to, uh, Dr. King's work is so important because it, as you said, Elena, gives us a reminder that for so long um, and growing up like uh, native in Canada or the land that's currently referred to as Canada, I, I found this was the case. Um, and I know that the context in the States is different, so we can talk about that too. But within Canada, um, being Native, there's always this push toward reconciliation, which means reconciliation with white settlers. And so we're consistently forced to think of our identity, our being, our lives, our theory, our dreams and hopes and just everything that we do in contrast only to white settlers um, and our relationality with white settlers and colonizers. Um, so to me, that was almost a, like the, it was, it's like cognitive dissonance. There was no possible way to move forward for that for me. And then I went to grad school in Toronto um, as Zainab mentioned, how influential Toronto was uh, for them. And Toronto was equally influential for me in that I got to study with um, Black scholars for the first time in my life. Um, so scholars like Ronaldo Walcott and Adele Abdullahi um, based in Toronto and, and start thinking about why it is that the systems have kept us from discussing our relationality as black and native people for so long um, and thinking about all of the potential power there, but also the real reckonings that non-black native people have to do with our history and anti-blackness and complicity and anti-blackness as well. Um, and you both sort of mentioned that at the, the outset in your identity pieces. So I'll just leave it there. Just want to say thank you, Erica, for that. Um, really appreciate the words you, you were speaking there. Um, so I should, I should just say, first of all, that I went to school in the 1980s in the University of Toronto. So um, the number of, of scholars that of, of um, Indigenous background that, you know, you could, there were less than, you know, you could count them on one hand, basically. So. Uh, this is like a, an incredible surge of, of Indigenous scholarship that we're experiencing and enjoying right now. And as I said, you know, during the civil rights movement, I was influenced by a number of different activists on the ground at the time. Um, in terms of Tiffany, Tiffany, yes, is one of my favorite people. I, I'm not familiar with her latest writings, but she is a person, like, I think we've influenced each other. Um, and... Uh, uh, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure specifically about what is is in her, her in her latest writings, but I know that I too have um, done that kind of thinking and wondered about. So, for example, I have um, one of my articles in Muskrat Magazine was entitled "For Clickbait: How to Survive White Supremacy," and it was really something that advocated, you know, just, um, you know, getting to know who we are and getting to forge relationships with those who are um, oppressed by white supremacy. And so, you know, just kind of, kind of getting to know each other and finding our power in that because um, as, uh, the, I, as someone, that, I don't know if any of you know, um, uh, the Ardak Algonquin co-chief, uh, Robert, oh my gosh, I forgot his last name. I'm just having a, a nervous um, uh, memory lapse here. Hopefully it'll come come to me. But anyways, he always talks about how um, you know resistance just takes so much out of you all the time. And he would rather he used to describe his work as an activist as resistance, but now he he would like to actually turn inward to the community and think about you know not that he's under any illusions that you know because he's 
fought, you know, mining incursions and the selling off of the, um, the rice beds and all this sort of thing in his community. And he talks about how exhausting it is to resist. And he'd rather, you know, make sure that people are fed and, and educated and know their language and their ceremonies and, you know, are able to feed themselves, you know, so that when, you know, white folks come knocking on the door that they, that they are healthy and, and able to, um, you know, to meet them. Uh, and sustain uh, their uh, activities. So um, that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's about building our relationships and creating that new future and not being under illusion, any illusions that eventually we are gonna have to deal with these other you know, white supremacy, but um, let's deal with it when we're strong, when we're healed, when we're um, you know, taking care of our own needs and, and, we're, and we're good to go. <laughs> That's my thinking on it. Thank you so much for what um, both of y'all just shared. Um, I always, I love listening <laughs> to your own personal journeys. Um, I was, I wanted to bring this up and I'm gonna do it really quickly because I actually am not very familiar with um, Dr. King's work. However, um, I wanted to take a class uh, a couple, maybe a year ago, um, and it was called um, Settler Colonialism, Anti-Blackness and Women's Resistance. And a major um, text of that class was, um, I think it's called The Black Schools by um, Dr. Tiffany King. And I was really excited to read that text. And in the end, I, I was unable to take the class and I haven't gotten to it, but I am really excited to read that work because I remember on the description of the class, I even like went back to get it and like read it. It said that we, the class would approach this beginning from the understanding that anti-Black violence in the so-called new world has always been enacted on Indian lands while anti-native genocide and dispossession on these lands has always been entangled with anti-blackness. And um, so we need to remember that these conceptions of race and culture as we know today were generated, molded and shaped through these colonial and violent interactions as were conceptions of private property corporate personhood and other deeply embedded and foundational features of the United States. Um, and this is just, I'm reading directly from um, the syllabus, but I remember being really excited to take this class and read that piece because I do wanna, I'm just really curious to learn more about the ways in which the native um, movement and black liberation movements can work together um, given all of the overlap that already exists and also we, I mean, going always back to the concept of like, we can't be free if not all of us are free. Beautiful, thank you, Sunshine. Well, Erica, you brought up anti-Blackness in the Native communities. Zainab, you brought up healing ourselves, strengthening ourselves so that we can fight white supremacy. You know, let's talk about anti-Blackness in Native communities. Um, Zainab, you and I both have connections to slave-owning Native tribes, um, the most well-known, uh, you with the Cherokee especially. I mean, there have been large strides with the Cherokee Nation recently. Um, if you're not familiar, like I'm sure my panelists are familiar, but if you are not familiar, my audience, um, there was a change in the Constitution, um, making it so that the by blood is taken out, uh, going back um gosh how much context do i give you hmm okay so five tribes owned um black people as slaves uh the cherokees the chickasaws the choctaws the creeks and the seminoles um they were basically forced to free their slaves uh the cherokees freed them two years before the end of the civil war uh, but the other four nations had to be forced by the u.s government to free them uh, they agreed they put it in their treaties with the united states after they ended the war so basically um, kind of their uh, secession, no, not secession, their treaties in which they reestablish uh, relationships with the United States after the Civil War. They agreed to adopt their slaves. Uh, they agreed to also um, adopt their slaves as citizens after freeing them. There's different language in each treaty. Um, but basically then over time, 
throughout the 1970s and 80s, uh, all of those five tribes then disenfranchised those citizens, so uh, removing them from their citizenship roles. Uh, and it's been a back and forth with all of these tribes, but especially with the Cherokee Nation, uh, because Marilyn Van, who is a Cherokee Freedman descendant, um, you know, took took this lawsuit all the way to the uh, U.S. District Court. She won. The Cherokee Nation was forced to change. And since then, uh, it does seem like more people have kind of voluntarily begun to change their views. Uh, but there are still sticklers. There are still people who believe that Black people, if they have Native ancestry or if they don't, uh, can never be part of the tribe, uh, even if they you know, were enslaved and lived with these tribal members for generations, even if they spoke the language, even if they, you know, had kind of all of the cultural bearings of these Indian nations. Um, and so for the five tribes, especially the kind of anti-Blackness is front and center because it's very obvious from these very public legal battles. Um, and other Indian nations, it's perhaps not as obvious. Uh, and you really would only know if you know about uh, like membership quotas or membership qualifications or various battles that have been fought in like especially eastern tribes i could say um so i just rambled on a lot but to my panelists um i don't know what what are your thoughts like either on the five tribes specifically on um i don't know how it is with canadian um nations you know just generally anti-blackness and in indian nations I can start with this one as well. Um, so I think that uh, for me, when I started to learn about the history of oppression um, and enslavement that non-Black Indigenous people did to, um, and still in many cases do to Black folks, um, it, it seemed so inconsistent to me, but then the, I, I actually like took a minute and read and started um, thinking about this deep, more deeply and realizing it, it, it makes perfect sense with sort of the, the way that non-Black Indigenous people are welcomed into civilization if we, um, if we, concede certain things if we agree to act like the colonizer if we like we'll never have full standing of course um alongside white folks but um we can sure do their bidding for them and uh that in many cases is exactly what happens with uh native communities and native nations uh so i'm not super familiar with the the Cherokee context in the States, but I do know that in Canada, it's still a problem. It's and still um, a, a topic of discussion. I know that I've seen firsthand um, black folks in native communities be ostracized, be criminalized at a rate higher than non-Black Indigenous people, and it's not taken into account here at, at all. Um, and so much of this to me also has to do with capitalism and sort of the desire to of Indigenous nations to be a part of that Aboriginal capitalism and and belong to a civilization that will never accept us by doing what they think is an act um, that will basically um, by oppressing black people um, will further entrench indigenous non-black indigenous people into some position of superiority which is colonial racist science and has no place in any kind of relationality that I want to be a part of. Thanks for that, Erica. Yeah, you know, I'm not up on this topic. I always feel when this topic gets raised that I need to say, first of all, that um, this uh, 
history doesn't apply to all Cherokee communities, right? So there's an Eastern band, there's, you know, Cherokee community in Texas, and, you know, there's a lot of Cherokee communities around, and, and this uh, applies to the Oklahoma territories. And I think, of course, it does stem um, from this, uh, you know, the, the five so-called civilized tribes that um, in mimicking white settler ways, you know, uh, were slave owning nations. Um, and you won't need any props for this class, but if you want to spice it up a little bit, you can join me and use a core ball. If you don't have a Okay. <laughs> I can ignore that one. Um, so yeah, so this this derives from that whole, and I feel like, um, again, I'm not, I wrote about this in a paper that I co-authored with um, Benita Lawrence, um, and we looked, it, it was titled Indigenous and Black Peoples in Canada, and there was a subtitle that I can't recall at the moment, um, but- Sellers are allies. Thank you. <laughs> Sellers are allies. So yeah, so I, so we talked about, you know, the five civilized tribes and that history of being slave owning nations, I don't think we, um, so we didn't go into a lot of detail. And of course that would have to be updated since 2009 when we put that paper out. But, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand that that just becoming slave owners and what it took, uh, you know, the, the treaties that were made and the splits that happened among the leadership of the, the Eastern Cherokee at that time, this is prior to the, um, uh, the walk out west, uh, the Trail of Tears, really split the nation and split the nation to the point where a lot of folks, uh, you know, packed up and went down and joined the, uh, the Seminole Rebellion, right, and fought off the American military from Florida, um, you know, and fought them to basically force them to come to treaty, basically. But um, so I'm just saying that there's a lot of stories here, and I don't want this to represent the entire Cherokee nation i my affiliation is not with the with that um that part of our, our nation at all um so again i'm not really up on the latest but i do feel like there is quite an injustice of course in you know black cherokees who were former slaves who were mixed race folks by the time that the um the trail of tears happened walked with the cherokee nation with all of the suffering and all of the the vile things that happened to people along that walk, when they got to the Oklahoma territories, they were there, they helped people as freedmen, you know, settle this new land, were members of the, the community in terms of, you know, sharing the workload and, and making a new life for people there. Um, and now suddenly they weren't, you know, part of the nation anymore. Uh, and they were seen, um, in other ways. So, I mean, I think there's a huge injustice here. And I feel like um, this is what happens when you try and mimic white settler ways instead of, you know, trying to center or, or centering your own, uh, your own value system, your own culture, your own spiritual and, and wisdom traditions, um, which, you know, this would have never happened if they had, you know, for example, followed uh, the leadership of the women um, originally type of thing, right? Or possibly never happened. Uh, but the men broke off and, you know, started uh, um, usurping their response, well, um, assuming they had authorities and powers that the communities have never given them. So anyways, so that's my take on that story. And I feel like it's a good lesson um, for us to learn from. I think that there's also been, you know, we can cherry pick history and find all kinds of examples of times when communities came together in resistance. And we can find other examples of, you know, when, you know, anti-indigenous sentiments and so forth and so on. Um, so I think that the point here is to learn something from these experiences and recognize what, you know, like nobody wins when you try and play the game of being a racist, nobody, <laughs> and you know, as an indigenous person, nobody wins, right? As a black person, and you try and play that racism game, nobody wins. And I think, again, when we go back to our own cultural values that, you know, there is, I think in both, um, in both, in both cultures, when you get down to the indigenous practices, and again, I don't wanna be pan-indigenous about this, but I do think there are very clear commonalities about 
you know, how we are interconnected and interrelated and, um, you know, that we're not above any, we're not even above the trees. We're not even above the plants. Like we can't be above each other. Sorry. Like it just, it doesn't work. And it leads us to nothing but grief and hardship and more oppression. And, and it's again, for me, a call to, um, to heal, to, you know, when we talk about decolonization, one of the things, the first things we talk about is decolonizing our minds, right? Decolonizing our, mind, our mindset. You can't create a peaceful world, a just world. Um, you know, if, you're, if your mind is about, you know, chasing ideas around superiority, if your mind is not at peace, if your mind is not about, um, you know, is about blaming and shaming other people, you're not going to create justice. And so I think that part of our struggles always have to go back and forth between looking inward and doing that healing work and doing that, that transformational personal development work. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you, I'll <laughs> leave it there. Oh, thank you, Sainam, I'm, I'm sitting with everything you said. I also can, if I can just um, respond, I wanted to say just a couple of things. I think uh, it's so tricky when we talk about uh, things that are traditionally native or traditionally like the ways that we were traditionally ran indigenous cultures and go back to that kind of idea. So for me, like to, to say something that, um, the enslavement of black folks isn't or wouldn't have been traditionally native is a dismissal of what is to me a real history of anti-blackness within non-black indigenous nations um, and i don't know that we can ever just reduce it to a learning experience that's another thing that i worry about is um, i've seen that happen a lot in non-black indigenous communities is like um you know to say oh we've we've been bad to each other and that's all in the past and the reality is it's not in the past um so we have to i think be very cautious of not erasing that history of anti-blackness and the, like the the core or at least this is what my teachers have taught me and sort of what makes sense to me now uh, my teachers and friends that anti-blackness is the core of, of racism. It's the core of how so much of this world operates that um, to extract ourselves from it traditionally or otherwise is to um, dismiss our responsibility in dealing with it head on. So that's just another thought that I had about it. Yeah, I want to thank you for that, Erica. I, 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 I agree um, with not burying it and not minimizing, and, and not thinking that it's relegated to the past. So yeah, thank you for that, for making me think about that. Um, and I just wanted to correct something in that I wasn't saying that this wouldn't have happened under, if we had been following our traditions. What I feel is that if, so what happened in this process was that the male leadership among the Cherokee, so, um, uh, it was the it was women who were in the leadership, the ultimate foundational leadership of the nation, and so it was the men that kind of, because um, uh, of the of the the relationships they had developed with um, white settlers, who then started making treaties and making agreements with white settlers in that time, and just completely stopped be, started behaving like um, you know patriarchal the patriarchal ways instead of looking at um, uh, or abiding by, you know, the way that that decisions got made in the community uh, prior to to settler colonialism. The other thing I just wanted to say, because I, I'm really sorry that I forgot the name of the person I was talking about, the co-chief of the Art of Algonquin um, people, which, who is Robert Lovelace, who actually by birth is also Cherokee, but he was adopted into the Art of Algonquin and uh, became co-chief. So he's the person I was talking about when I was talking about uh, article gone from people earlier on. Um, but yes, I do want to thank you for that, Erica. Yeah, I mean, there are 
multiple ways I think Native people and historians and scholars of different backgrounds think about the adoption of Black slavery. I mean, is it um, a continuation of Indigenous captivity practices where the kind of lower class is now like permanent? Um, is it just kind of them wanting to settle into a class or a practice that is accepted by white settlers and that will then allow them to be accepted in a different way. Um, I mean, that's that's what I've written in my book, like this idea that um, if we adopt this language, if we adopt this way of thinking, if we adopt slavery, that we will be more accepted. And for a time they are, right? Like they are looked at as different than other native people, but it's not enough to save them from removal. It's not enough to save them from their land being taken multiple times. So it's, I think it's complex, but when we look at, um, these various times in history when Native people and Black people have come together, I kind of wanted to bring that into the present because when I kind of saw what was going on last summer and really since then, there has been an explosion of like events that are looking to intersect Black and Native peoples. And like, let's talk about Black and Native art together and let's talk about anti-Black racism in Native communities and like a, a dialogue that I feel was not there before. Um, perhaps it was and I didn't see it. But do you all think that this could be a sustained change? Is this like just another blip when people are coming together and then we're just going to be kind of wrenched apart by the pressures of really kind of reconciling what has been a really long struggle between these two groups? I think that's such a great question. Um, I definitely noticed this, um, I guess, union of movements. I feel like I myself am part of the folks who was more leaning on one side and then now like I've been like learning so much more um, about like beyond black liberation. And I feel like if I think of even just I use I do use a lot of social media to follow um, activists that I almost don't have access to in other spaces. Um, and now I found myself the other day I noticed how many pages I've been following that deal with both like um, indigenous liberation and uh, black liberation. And specifically because I'm from Brazil, grew up in Brazil and follow a lot of Brazilian activists, especially there right now, the merging of these two communities that used to be separated. And in Brazil specifically, because Brazil was um, uh, the second major recipient, recipient of um, enslaved folks during the transatlantic slave trade. So our population, like we have such heavy, um, Afro heritage, like Afro heritage, but also um, native heritage, and then a really large Afro indigenous population that was erased and has been deprived from their roots, right? That like no longer, that many people, including um, my, a really close friend of mine didn't know a lot about her roots until two years ago, um, as she joined the Black Lives Matter movement was when she started reconnecting with her indigenous roots. And I'm seeing that happen to so many folks in Brazil right now and so many activists and stuff like that. So I feel like, especially after last summer, I did see this change, but you did catch me on, is it sustainable? And will what will it look like in the future? I have a sense that it is sustainable and that it will last, particularly because I do see um, Native folks and Native activists and Afro-Indigenous folks and then Black folks. I feel like, I don't know how else to put it, but I feel like when you're part of these two communities um, and you start seeing the overlap and and the, I, I just feel like there's no going back when you do create that bridge, um, but I don't know. Sorry. I agree with Sunshine. I hope that 
well, I really believe that there there has to be no going back for us because um, we just can't live in a world anymore that is so predicated on anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity. It's just completely unsustainable and unjust. So there is no going back for me. Wow, I'm glad to hear that from both of you. So um, for me, uh, I don't know, I don't predict the future, but I do know that things don't just happen. They don't come out of nowhere, um, that we create the future. We create, um, we create the future by, uh, you know, through our intentions, through our work that we're doing now. And so it's all going to depend on, you know, what, what we put into this work, what intentions, you know, how much healing we're doing, how much individual and collective healing that we're doing. And you know what kinds of foundations we're building. Work that you're doing now in the present. That's how I kind of feel about it. Thanks. Well, and these are really multiple movements that have to come together. I mean, like there are native people who have this history of slavery who have to reconcile with that, um, who are like otherwise okay with like Black Lives Matter and kind of leaning into that movement, but you know, reconciling that own history that they have, that their ancestors have, uh, that's a little harder. Um, so there are, you know, kind of different intersecting threads, I think, in this conversation about uh, what a future movement could look like with um, these people's working together. Um, so I, I think, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I just remembered a conversation that I had a couple of days ago when I was thinking about this talk. And um, now that you bring in the intersection of these movements and like the pieces that we can gain from all of them, I was thinking about it and I could be wrong. I definitely have a lot of a lot to learn still on this on these subjects, but I feel like one thing that I think that is so beneficial beneficial from this um, merging together of all these movements, not merging, but coming together of all these movements is um, I feel like in the process of Black liberation and Black liberation movements, because we've had to fight for um, equal rights so much, I think that often the fight for Black liberation can get a little bit lost in um, trying to gain rights into a broken system, right? So, um, which is like fighting for a right to assimilate, fighting for a right to sit on a table that was, that table never worked for us in the first place. And when I think of the works that I've read by Native folks and like Indigenous sovereignty, I think that's just already inherently like, separate from the system altogether. And I, I appreciate that because I feel like we now, especially this year after 2020, I think that we've, from what I've observed, I think that there has been a shift from let's try to hop into the system that is broken and try to fix it from within to let's acknowledge all the ways in which this system has been bad in the first place and let's like try to move away from the system instead of like work within it more and I really do appreciate that and I feel like a lot of that for me has come from indigenous literature. So. Well related to that uh, we have an audience question that is asking really kind of how do you begin to educate yourself um, and I might add to that like how might you recommend someone beginning to involve themselves in activist work or even just, you know, educating yourself in your community, which is part of activist work? Um, that's a big question. I think that to tackle it 
we can come from so many different places. And I think that also it's so important to think like, how do I, so how do I get started? How do I get started in educating myself and then from education to taking action? And I think that especially after 2020, like like this question just became the question of the year, I think last year, right? Like, what do I do? How how can I do? How do I get started? And 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 also acknowledging that the the labor in that question did end up falling on um, black folks or indigenous folks or people of color um, to answer like how can you get started? And I think that that question sometimes has to be like asked like from like like how how can you get started? Um, because if I'm thinking my journey, my journey started unfortunately as much as I have a specific like I don't know what the word would be I guess I can't use hatred but I have my feelings towards the academy um, and being in academia and I'm on my way out so as much as I have all of these feelings towards the academy I will acknowledge the ways in which moving to like education and literature did get myself started um, so I always say like to my friends who say, oh, like, what can I do? How can I get started? I'm like, first of all, like, look around you. So like, what do you do? Where do you spend most of your time? Do you spend most of your time in school or do you spend most of your time on social media? What do you do at your job? What, where do you spend your time? And then start there because for young folks on social media, you need to be following the right activists. You need to be following indigenous folks. You need to be following black folks and listening to them. Or, and you need to look at your own identities and see like, what can you do based off of like where you stand right now, your positionality, um, your identities, what you have access to, and then where your time is. So for me, that looked like taking the right classes um, at the time. And then the second I realized like, okay, like I got started, I have some names down, I want to bring this outside of academia, then it was all getting connected with the community, just, just in-person community work, and then and listening to people. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, this is not my favorite question either. <laughs> I am 66 years old, and um, that question might have made some sense back in the 1960s. <laughs> But honestly, today, you know, when you've got an entire world's worth of information at your fingertips, right? I just don't, I just don't understand that question. Um, so that's, that, that's my response to the question. But I also feel too, that we, sh we should be careful of constantly looking outward and putting our efforts into transforming the world, you know, transforming our, our government and our institutions and it's it's they're the problem they're the problem they're the problem the world that we exist in is in whole or in part a reflection of our mindset our our ways of knowing and so you know traumatized people traumatize people right that's how it goes right so I feel like um there are, I mean, you know, you can find all these resources and you can, you know, Black Lives Matters really, Black, Black Lives Matter has really um, uh, just really inspired me in terms of the work that it's doing, but also uh, the support that it offers to so many Indigenous struggles. I mean, the Dakota Access Pipeline, the uh, Keystone XL stuff, the and and again, you can look online. You can find like all of these different struggles that are happening. Wet'suwet'en and Wet'suwet'en and um, the Mi'kmaq fishermen, and even on the lands where I work, there's um, this <laughs> Indigenous land reclamation that's happening with the youth. Um, it, our our organization is located in a park and. In the spring, you know, forget the pandemic. These youth just set up their tents and their fire uh, fire pit, and and the the park is under treaty to the Mississaugas of New Credit, and they claimed it. You know, so they're our neighbors um, and our landlords, apparently. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I agree with you know looking around you, like looking online. Um, who are you friends with? Who are you interacting with? Um, 
what's the history of the land that you walk on, that you live on, that you work on? You know, who were the peoples there? What is that the relationship of your community to um, to the enslavement of Black peoples? Um, and all of these questions, but I really feel like there's also an element of looking inward in this process as well that I don't want us to ever forget. Thank you. Yeah, those are really great answers. I agree with this. This question is very difficult. It happens at every panel and I always find it equally difficult to answer. And I think that's because um, when I think of like, how I got started in organizing, it was because it wasn't a choice. Um, and I would imagine that's the same with everyone on this panel and all of the black and indigenous people um, who are now organizers. Um, is it, It's because we literally didn't have a choice. Like my mom brought me to meetings when I was a little kid and I was crawling around on the floor getting radicalized as a baby. <laughs> because she didn't have like childcare um, for her anti-poverty coalition meetings. So that's how I started um, was not a choice. Um, so I think if you have the choice, you have to first recognize that that is a privilege. And, um, and then as Zainab said, use your time wisely. Um, and Sunshine mentioned like there's so many resources and I think often now it can be a case of not so much lacking resources as uh, resource overwhelm, being overwhelmed by resources. Um, but there's like something in every medium, there's podcasts, there's YouTube videos now, there's TikToks, like, um, so yeah, just be, just be critical and, and push yourself. Um, me being out of school for the first time and like 25 years this year has been uh, pushing myself to read Black authors, to stay up to date with um, the theory that I want to be a part of, because I know um, like it probably isn't being taught in schools anyway, so you don't have to worry about really falling behind in that sense like just uh and twitter is a has been a great resource for me as well i've learned so much from folks on twitter organizers and academics alike yeah um that that question is a question of privilege i i think when did we get started when were we not i guess in this so it's it's a privileged question and i feel like Often I see us struggling to answer it. Um, and it's, I can't relate, <laughs> so. Well, thank you all for giving those uh, responses to that question. That is the question, as you all said that, you know, um, I have gotten it every like semester even I've had um, recently. So, you know, um, <laughs> There is, I think, one more question I want to get to. Um, so someone asks, what are your thoughts on the importance of building bridges with African descendants and indigenous peoples from South America, uh, for example, who have parallel issues, but, you know, a different context? I will jump in on it quickly-ish um, just because of my background, but um, I, you, you, you hit right on the right words when you said at the end, who have um, a similar history, perhaps parallel history, but a little bit different. And um, lately I've been participating in some events, but also sharing some videos on the internet and, just been in circles and I feel like I do get that. I, I get a lot of, um, what did they, a major thing that has been said to me was don't impose your identity politics onto us and the us in this context being um, South America or Latin America or, and stuff like that. And people saying, telling me particularly like in specific instances, that my wanting to bring up racism in South America or racism in within people of color communities um, 
and I've, and I've gotten people saying, you don't understand everything is different everywhere you go. And I think that that's a method of distancing ourselves from um, engaging in something that we can learn more about. So I think that it's really, really important. I think that there's no way that we can combat anti-Black racism or anti-Indigenous oppression or any, anything like that without understanding the history of these things elsewhere, because all of these things are interconnected. And like anti-Blackness, yes, it acts differently um, across the globe. And there are different dynamics at place in different continents, in different countries. But anti-Blackness, that's, that's kind of universal. Like that has been brought into every corner of this world, unfortunately. And colonization is this process, like, like the, the whole, the entire process of globalization, colonization, like we can't separate ourselves from what's happening in other places um, when it comes to these type of issues. Um, so I, I feel like it's, I don't know if I forget how the question was phrased, but I do feel like it's extremely important to um, not only engage with the issues like in your current geographical location. I'm sorry that I won't be able to answer that question because I didn't hear it because my machine froze, so. <laughs> oh, you, you know, you can respond, Erica. You can repeat the question. Okay, uh, the question was about um, basically finding and creating bridges uh, between Black and Indigenous communities in uh, other spaces such as South America. So my thought on this, thank you for repeating that for us. Um, my thought on this is the same as Sunshine's. I, um, in some of the organizing work that I've done, particularly with Idle No More, which was, uh, was and is uh, indigenous rights, indigenous um, freedom movement in, I don't wanna say indigenous rights, <laughs> indigenous right, rights and freedoms and, resistance movements in uh, lots of things to many different, many different things to lots of people, movement based in Canada and, uh, but it, it went to all around the world and it was my first introduction into like so many different indigenous struggles across the world. Um, and so many of those indigenous struggles are black indigenous struggles as well. Um, so that was uh, like a huge, like changing um, of a lot of assumptions that I had of what indigenous organizing looked like in the world. Um, and what I learned from that experience is that community-based organizing is so often the most powerful form of organizing you can do because it's specific to your own community. Um, your, only your community knows what your community needs and it's so it's like adaptable to each, although we're facing these, these huge overarching problems like anti-Blackness and colonialism and patriarchy and capitalism, we can situate those our responses to those and our resistance to that within our own communities. And that's what makes it so powerful. Um, so that's my response to Sunshine's response. Um. I just, I love what you said. So I just want to like highlight that. I think that for me too, like a huge learning experience and like, just like an enriching experience has been like, I feel like in answering that question, like, yes, it is extremely important that we do learn about places outside of our own, but from that community base, like, like from the community itself, because we have so much to learn from how this community handled the issues that are impacting that community in that geographical location. And we can learn how this can help us here. And we like we need to be listening to communities um, and not coming in with our own preconceived ideas about that community, but just like it is important to not only say, um, I acknowledge that things there might be different, but also like, and I will take it upon myself to listen to them.
Yes, um, thank you both. Um, lots of agreement here for me and I, I do think that yes, we can, we can and should learn from each other and support each other. I also feel like things like racism and um, capitalism <laughs> are global issues and, and everybody needs to mobilize um, at some level to deal with these issues. Um, and I also feel that uh, communities are unique uh, in some ways, in many ways. And we also have to be clear around not assuming that the solution in this part of the world is the solution that in another part of the world and uh, that the problems look the same. You know, there's different histories and different cultures at play here. And so to have that respect, but um, yes, I, I mean, obviously like we can learn from each other and support each other and um, connect with each other uh, and build those relationships uh, and the foundations of relationships for the future. So I wanted to end on a question that is, uh, I think, pretty positive. Uh, it's about wellness. Um, how are all of you keeping yourselves well, like during a pandemic, when we are still facing all of the things you mentioned, uh, racism, you know, paternalism, capitalism, all of these things, um, on top of, you know, COVID, death, illness, how are you taking care of yourself? Um, so for me, <laughs> particularly at my age, I don't really have a choice. It's kind of like, <laughs> it's into my, my daily routine. Um, so I do have, you know, spiritual practices and wellness practices that I, that I do every day. I mean, the usual thing, meditations, breathing, all kinds of things that, that I do. Um, I feel a, a powerful component of my wellness is also in service in helping others. So, you know, um, we've got the mutual aid stuff here as well. I'm still working. I'm still, um, you know, offering what I can to the youth that I work with and the organizations that I work with. I'm still writing uh, and with the intention in mind of, again, creating something better than what we have and recognizing this as an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, we it's very clear that you know there's a lot of hardships and a lot of concerns about this pandemic. And I think the United States perhaps is experiencing it a bit differently than Canada is, because we do have things like, you know, um, healthcare, you know, as flawed as they may be, we do have, uh, you know, uh, single payer healthcare and other types of things that are not available to people in the States. Uh, still, you know, we want to, we tend to want to con uh, concentrate on that, but I think, it's a it's a good sign and a bad sign that you know this pandemic is, as as the uh, economists of all stripes are saying, you know, it's transforming everything. You know, we're not nothing's going back to normal. We we we, it's all collapsing, and this is an incredible opportunity to start creating something new and different, and to start dreaming really big and really radically about what could replace this these systems of oppression, and injustice, um, and so. That dreaming, it keeps me well, <laughs> keeps me in good spirits. Thank you. Someone I follow on Twitter that really helps me. I, social media in general is like a crapshoot. You never know what you're gonna get in a pandemic. Um, but there's one account in particular and they're on, uh, Instagram as well, the nap ministry, uh, which is so good. Um, I believe the nap ministry is a black woman. Um, I think, uh, or a black, they, them, uh, uh, described person. And they talk about rest as revolutionary and <laughs> It's been so liberating and freeing for me to just, first of all, um, come to terms with the fact that I identify as a disabled person, even though I'm young um, and someone who's not neurodivergent as well as queer and indigenous and visibly racialized and all intersectional, all of those things. 
um, and poor, and that um, the discussions about madness and uh, crip life and resting, just the simple act of resting as a revolutionary, especially for Black women, queer folks, um, disabled folks, to me has been like life-saving. So I'm really thankful for that work um, as well. I want to give a shout out. I have to give a shout out to this book in every panel that I'm on because I think it's such a good <laughs> book. Um, this is Sadia Hartman's most recent work, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval. And I keep it with me all the time because I think it's just a perfect book. And in it, uh, Dr. Hartman talks about the histories of, and lives of Black girls and women after, uh, after slavery and just living their lives in the city for the first time. And it's, it's such an accessible, enjoyable, but very like impactful at the same time read. Um, so to me, um, I owe a lot to the, the Black intellectuals and community members who are doing that kind of work to keep us all sane and semi-sane, as sane as we can be without it being, <laughs> um, without it being a requirement in this time, because boy, is it a struggle. Thank you so much for that recommendation. I'm, I'm excited I wrote that down. Um, I appreciated something you said. I mean, a lot of what you said, but I really appreciated how you brought up like making, I, I don't know if this was, these were the words that you used, but I think for me, um, part of being or trying to be well during the pandemic has been reconciling, like, like understanding myself as a disabled person as well and like neurodivergent and like actually like allowing myself to be in the ways that I am right now. And I think that when the pandemic started um, all over the place, like you said, like about social media, you know, you could find all types of things. And I think that all of these, how to thrive in the pandemic, like guides and like how to be well in the pandemic. And, and I tried them and I feel like I tried all of these systems that were being fed to me as like, if you follow ABC, you will for sure the outcome will be wellness throughout a global pandemic. And I none of that worked. And I think that that was really disappointing for me. And I think that it also did not allow myself to acknowledge the ways in which I am not the normal or like maybe the audience that those were made for. Um, and then making my peace with that. And I think I'm still in the process of that. So as I was thinking about this, I was like, Yes, the NAP ministry, I love them. I follow them for such a long time, I love them. And on the daily, I try to internalize the messages they send, but it's so hard to accept rest as resistance and accept rest, especially as like a queer, disabled, like immigrant black person. I think that rest is not allowed. Um, and I, so even though I've been following the NAP ministry for so long, I feel like now they're like extremely like relevant and I'm still like working on like um, internalizing those messages. But I think that right now for me, what's bringing me a little bit more wellness is one, doing that process of like acknowledging what does not work for me and um, community. Uh, I think that also in entering the pandemic, there was a lot of rhetoric of like introverts, like, you know, oh, I was an introvert anyways, I'm going to do great. Or like, like those type of things, you know, like, oh, this is great for this, or this is great for that. I think I needed to understand that I am not an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I miss my community. I miss people. I need to be in touch with people. And I also care about my community and I care about people. So I'm not going to be out in the world doing things. So like trying to like connect virtually or in any ways that I can with other folks who are more like me is something new that I'm trying to do to be well, um, instead of like trying to adapt to what works for, um, I guess the masses. I don't even know if what is being said that works for the masses works for the masses. I don't know who is fully well in this pandemic, but it's not me. 
Well, thank you all so much. This was lovely. We are actually over time, so I'm going to turn you all over to Alexa so she can close us out. We're just on time. It's it's a beautiful uh, thing, and oh, you can see the the sun. The sun is setting on me, so I guess it really does need to end. Um, I am so thankful to to the four of you. I'm so thankful to Sunshine, Saint Erica, and Elena for you know the generosity of your time today, and obviously the gracious um, gifts of your thoughts and perspectives. So thank you. Um, I'll be sitting with all this for a long time. I think everyone else will be. Um, because we're in a regular Zoom meeting, I would love us to, to take advantage of the fact that people now can turn on their videos and unmute and maybe show some uh, love and appreciation for um, our guest speakers and moderator. So feel free to do that, everybody. Turn it, turn it on, let everyone see you. Bravo! Let's see the beautiful people. Thank you well so done. much. Um, and also, of course, I appreciate all of you who took time out of your out of your day, out of your busy lives, um, to join us. And and, and hopefully, um, this will also sit with you in a in a beautifully challenging <laughs> and encouraging way. So again, thank you for coming. Um, be yeah. safe. Be safe, be as well as possible. I, I, I wish for all of you that you also figure out ways to be as well as possible during this time. Thank you, have a good evening. Thank you all, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you.